So, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name's Neil Ward. I'm one of the Pro Vice Chancellors here at UEA, and I'd like to welcome you all to tonight's inaugural lecture. Uh, I'm delighted to be introducing Dabo Guan, Professor of Climate Change Economics. Uh, Dabo has worked at UEA School of International Development since October 2014. Uh, alongside his position as an academic researcher here, he's also a senior member of St Edmunds College at the University of Cambridge and a visiting professor at Tsinghua University in China. Dabo specialises in environmental economics for international climate change mitigation and climate change adaptation. He conducts scenario analysis on the environmental impacts of climate change and the management of water resources and explores the applications of this in both developed and developing countries. He's the author of over 70 publications, including articles published in Science and Nature magazines, and has gained extensive media coverage for his research into climate change and car uh, China's carbon emissions. Uh, Darbo is a lead author uh, for the fifth assessment report for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and he's been awarded numerous academic prizes for his contributions to climate change economics, including the PNAS Cosarelli Prize in 2014 and a Philip Leverhulme Prize. Uh, before taking up his current position here at the University of East Anglia, Dabo was a senior lecturer at the University of Leeds for three years, as well as a senior research associate at the Cambridge Centre for Climate Change Mitiga Mitigation Research and a research associate at the University of Cambridge's Judge Business School. Uh, prior to this, he worked for the Worldwide Fund for Nature as an economist. Uh, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to visitors to UEA this evening, uh, and I will now ask Professor Dabo Guan to present his inaugural lecture. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Tabo Guan. I'm a native Chinese and uh, I work in the UK for, well, study and work in the UK for si almost 16 years. So uh, it's a glad, you know, I'm very glad to be here tonight and uh, to present, uh, to summarize the work I've been doing over the last uh, decade almost and uh, working on the climate change and the internet of trade. Um, uh, my background is uh, trained as an economist, but not a mainstream economist. So saving the banks or the saving us from the uh, financial crisis, I, I'm trying to look at the, uh, the environmental side of the work and by using trade as a storyline to, to talk about the story. Um, right, perhaps let me get started on the, uh, uh, my uh, lecture here. Uh, we're going to talk about the climate change policy and uh, people, I. I assume people have a small, some background about uh, climate change and uh, the global warming. Uh, I try to use uh, not so much jargons, and I try to use a lay language to explain what we have been achieved over the last uh, few years, mainly using China as a, as a, as a uh, key focus to s carry out the story. I'm being working as an economist. The mainstream is, I mean, uh, task is trying to perf uh, uh, conduct performance assessment for the climate change policy. So really, you know, there's a so number of uh, climate policy. I really want to know whether those policies are effective or is a success or, or, or is not really successful. Let me just give you all some of the, the summary of the milestone of climate policies achieved over the last couple of decades. Firstly, there's uh, 1992, uh, the U United Nations Framework Convention. They, uh, they make one of the agreements, which is I highlight here, on why did the dangerous human-induced climate change, and later on translated as, say, uh, not exceeding two degrees C in the Bali uh, you know, in 2012, I think. But in 1992, the scientists and the politicians made agreement that we try to limit the temperature rising uh, to avoid the global warming. And in 1997, it's a very, very important year of the climate change because 192 countries, the leaders 
or the uh, president or the chairman, so they gather in the Kyoto in Japan to sign this uh, famous Kyoto Protocol. There are two objectives in the uh, list in the Kyoto Protocol, but people often forget the second one. But nevertheless, let's review the, the, the first one is, tr is reduce GHG emission, which is greenhouse gas emissions in Annex B country, which is a developed countries, 5% below 1990s level. And uh, don't forget, actually, there's a second objective. They say, says help non-Annex B countries, which is developing countries, to tackle GHG emissions. So really, what's the prog progress has been to date? And what's the best way forward? We're just trying to do it together. Let's see how it goes. This is a, a, a figure shows emission growth between 1990s, CO2 emission growth between 1990 and 2010 in 20 years' time. So I, I divide this uh, the figure into two periods. So before 2000, the globally emission growth at 1% per year. After we have uh, the uh, Kyoto Protocol and other climate change policy, emission growth by 3.4%. So it basically literally tripled the growth. So whether the climate policy is a good thing or not, it's, you know, this is what I'm asking. Why, you know, we are, we are trying to upgrade to limit the emission growth and suddenly once we sign this, this, this is emission growth tripled. Uh, if you are care, you know, you know the climate change uh, negotiations, this year is a one for the big year, and uh, you know, possibly in 20 days, uh, 25 days, uh, all the leaders will gather in Paris, they're gonna sign another, hopefully they're gonna sign another uh, uh, climate change agreement. Well, we, what we re usually refer to right now is a post-Kyoto climate change policy. So if after Paris, are we going to see a 9% growth after this? So if the climate policy is so bad, whether we need it or not, why this is people, uh, it is so fascinating to, to get people sign uh, agreements like that, if we know the, the, uh, the, uh, um, the, the policy is, is not, not good. And we are trying to go behind this uh, trend, see what's going on, why it's like that. Related to the Kyoto Protocol, there's the two objectives, as I said. The first one is, uh, you know, we are doing pretty good. The first one was the help uh, the developing, developed countries, that, and uh, NXP countries, they're gonna achieve 5% reduction below 1990s level. So the black line here, it's, it's fine. Although uh, United States, Canada, Japan, Australia, some of the developed countries, during the uh, Kyoto Protocol implementation period, they pull out from the, uh, the, the, the agreement, but because of their contribution from Europe, and also thanks to the financial crisis we have currently, um, you know, the emissions, pretty much stabilized and actually achieved over 5% growth for the developed country as a whole. But the problem, don't forget, we had a second objective in the Kyoto Protocol saying that help developing countries to limit their growth, but we are really not doing a good job. In 2004, 2005, the developing country as a whole over, uh, over uh, take over the, uh, the developed countries become the large, largest emitter uh, in the world. And mainly contributed, say, China. Some by India, but mainly China. We talk so much about you know, emissions and growth. Really, how we count for the emissions? I'm, I'm tr tr trying to give some of the ideas. How do we count emissions in the world? And what emission counting methodology and the international or the, the politicians using for, for, for negotiations. If we summarize this, it's actually two big categories. One is a, a focus on production-based emissions, the other focus on consumption-based. But within the production base, there's a two uh, uh, type of, uh, uh, well, not two types. One is the uh, less 
incomplete what we call in, uh, territorial emission accounting, which all the countries are using right now, including Kyoto Protocol. Also, the uh, Paris is gonna <coughs> using this meth methodology to do this. So, what, what are they? So, territory emission accountings, really, if we have two countries, like country A as a, uh, China, uh, let's say United States, and the country B is China. So whoever, uh, you know, whatever the uh, factories or emission coming in the United States, is United States emissions. And uh, whatever emitted in the territory of Chinese boundaries, that's Chinese emissions. But what are the missing ones? So the linkage between that is missing. So there's aviation, international aviation, and the international shipping are missing. Why they are missing? Why we don't do it to just allocate it? Because when they set up this uh, territory emission accounting framework uh, in, in 1990s, at that time, the aviation and international shipping is very small in terms of uh, uh, GHG emissions. They were less than half percent of the uh, global total at that time. But now, you know, because of the trade, because you guys go to holidays, it's increasing so much. Uh, I don't have a latest figure, but by 2012, the internet shipping and the aviation account for 15%, one fifth, 15% of global total already. But still, the the uh, the politicians hasn't been able to use, uh, you know, allocate this. The purely because it's quite difficult. Because uh, you have a British Airway fly from uh, Heathrow to New York, and they possibly mix between British and Americans. Possibly there's a few Chinese like me and uh, Mexicans, etc. But whose emission it is? So it's it's you know how do you allocate these things? It's complicated. And similarly for the shippings, you know you send your parcels to the U.S. or to China uh, by you know by a, like a Korean car, uh, you know ferry. And whose responsibilities? Uh, later on, the uh, uh, EU researchers proposed this, uh, what they called production-based uh, uh, emission accounting framework, which allocates this emission, uh, you know, international shipping emissions based on this production uh, uh, basic framework. But they're saying that if there's a US here, and this is China, and the link, like say the flight or the aviation between them, it doesn't really matter if it's a British Airway or there's this Air China or there's this Qantas or there's, it doesn't really matter. Whoever, which, if it depart from Heathrow, Heathrow is a British uh, airport, that's the UK emission. The, the logic behind that is uh, you, you need feeling, uh, fueling the, the aircraft so that the petroleum or the 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 the, uh, the air uh, you know the fuse is produced or, or is is here. So therefore, it's, it doesn't matter how many British is sitting on the British Airway uh, or Air China, whatever the flight is, and it's just your emission is. And similarly, if there's a, a aircraft that fly from Beijing to Heathrow, that is Chinese emissions. It's simple like that. Otherwise, there's no way you can you can. Uh, you know, allocated become a very complicated. And the little things about inter international tourism. So if you, you know, as a British visit the Chinese, uh, Chinese cities and uh, your consumptions there and your emissions there are still counts for uh, British emissions. So, but they are slightly, it's still quite small right now. And that, but uh, due to the globalization, that possibly will increase significantly. So uh, it, by definition, if you are by, you know, they defined by uh, nationalities. If you are British, and it, although you are in China, but it's still Britain universe, uh, uh, emissions. This is uh, basically from production perspective, really who emits, who take the responsibility. But the other type of uh, uh, emission accounting framework, what we call consumption-based, so we got um, you know, uh, United States here, and we got China. United States imports large amounts of goods from China. Is this fair to put those emissions to Chinese people? Similarly, Chinese 
uh, China they got imports from uh, you know from U.S. as well. So is this fair for the U.S. citizens to take the Chinese consumptions? So really, so from consumption perspective, is that whatever you produced minus whatever you export plus whatever you import. So this is the basic uh, uh, basic uh, rationale behind this. So um, so really, it's it's um, the territorial producer emission accounting approach tells you where the emission happened. And it happened in the US, happened in the UK. But the consumption emission accounting tells you why the emission happened. So, but there's a two different approach. Which one is more fair? And who's, whose responsibility? You know, when it comes to the policy discussions and negotiations, they always come, you know, China is the world manufacturers that produce so much. I'm pretty sure right now, uh, possibly five years ago, almost everything you wear is made in China, maybe 90%. And, uh, and now, possibly down to the, 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 the ratio down to 50 or 40%. But still, a half of what you are wearing right now, you know, in, 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 including glasses, the scarves, the laptops you're using, possibly large amounts is, uh, is made in China. Is this a fair for the emission to produce those things and then you are benefiting with that, it's, it's should take the, uh, the, the Chinese people should take that. I'll give you another example, not about emission, but toys. So on the left hand side is where the toy produced. The world toy production, you can see that mostly it's produced here, which is the, uh, you know, in, you know, uh, East, you know, China and then, you know, uh, South Asia countries produce. But on the other hand, the same, same coin, but a different side, it's world consumption, the, uh, the toy consumption, is largely consumed by us in the Europe and the US. And uh, Italy, it's uh, actually the world largest uh, per capita wise for the toy consumptions and uh, many uh, grandparents buy their uh, toys for their grandchildren and uh, Italy is especially the case and uh, okay so uh, really it's uh, whose responsibility if we talk about the toy cons uh, you know if a toy too toxic or to consume so much resources and whose responsibility to take the reduction Division of labor, because of the um, uh, even small things, another example for the toothbrush, even a small toothbrush, the electronic one, it requires multi, multiple, a dozen of uh, countries co-produce these products. And you know, how do we count those emissions? How, how do, do we gonna relocate those things and how we are gonna uh, really talk about responsibility for uh, reducing the emissions for producing toothbrush. Toothbrush is just an example, but anything even more complicated is even more locations you're gonna uh, produ uh, involved in terms of producing this. We have uh, spent some effort to allocate the, the emissions, the CO2 emissions from production perspective to consumption perspective as the two things we, we said. Because they are eventually it's just the same same uh, you know same thing, but f you can see the uh, sector changes over the allocation process. From production perspective, power plants, electricity generations is always the biggest user or biggest contributor to the uh, CO two emissions, the yellow one. But Nobody eats electricity. You are using for lightings, a little bit for charging your phones, but large amounts of the electricity is using for uh, processing, processing uh, steel, processing metals, and the produce uh, cements, etc. And uh, so the electricity mainly, you know, disappeared during the uh, allocation uh, process, become the construction sector becomes the, uh, the largest uh, contributor from consumption perspective. If you think about the construction sector, the supply chain of the construction sector, what do they need? To fulfill the construction demand, you will need cement, you need metal, you need steel, you need glass, you need bricks, 
and all those things, when you're producing those things, you need large, you will produce lots of emissions or you burn lots of fossil fuel uh, fuels. Uh, similarly, uh, machinery, heavy machineries, etc., they are the they are the major contributors to the uh, uh, to the uh, glo uh, climate change from the consumption perspective. Okay, so that's uh, basically uh, some of the method. We are uh, basically give you some introduction about the method. Next, I'm gonna talk uh, uh, the case for China, and we are gonna use the the method. I'm just saying and uh, to, to flag out, uh, flat some, uh, flush out some of the ideas or the, the stories I'm going to say. So um, I'm a proud of being a Chinese because we make miracles and we, we, we just, we love miracles. Right now there's some, um, you know, Chinese uh, economic development has been slowed down a little bit. But there's, um, I think it's a tradition for the all Asian countries, because the Indians making double digits growth, and they saying they are gonna make, um, they are make another miracle, so gonna take over China to become the, uh, the largest economy. So it's, it's really uh, in the next few years. If that happens, it's really a, a miracle, basically. So uh, just summarize, uh, you know, economic growth by using a different, uh, from, from the uh, people's lifestyle perspective. So uh, over the last, say, 30 years, since China really opened up for the international world, uh, like the end of the uh, 1970s, or like early of 1980s, Chinese economy, you know, the Chinese people has experiencing from poverty to enough food to and clothes. And a, a large share of the Chinese achieve well-being lifestyles. Chinese economic structure has been shifting from agriculture-based economy to very much industry-based, most of the provinces in the industry-based, and uh, more and more service sector playing an important part in their economy. Education side, way in the UEA, one of the education sector, we are experiencing from a poor education, which is, you know, people cannot afford to go to schools, and 99% uh, of the air, uh, China achieve nine years of free schooling uh, systems, and now, uh, China is the largest PhD producer in the world, and they are having a, uh, having a, a debate whether we need so much PhDs rather than electricians or plumbers. And uh, there's uh, like, a, uh, like a relatively low scale of the uh, uh, you know, labor intensive uh, work, workers have, you know, has been shrink very much. And then now you find a plumber or electrician uh, in, in Beijing or in Shanghai, it has a similar, similar price you find it here in the UK, at least in, in Norwich, not so to London. So, uh, you know, whether we need so much PhDs. We uh, make world number one. We love to make world number ones. We have the high, the, the, the high speed rail, uh, so uh, 430 kilometers per hour, so the uh, MacNav. Uh, connect you from uh, Shanghai Airport, Pudong Airport, to the city center by seven minutes, and uh, which is a 30, 35 kilometers, I think. And uh, we just uh, talk about how slow my uh, my friend came from Cambridge to to Norwich. Uh, so I had a statistics, uh, uh, basically from Peterborough to Norwich is one of the slowest train one of the slowest train in, in the world, almost. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's pretty much similar to, um, uh, to 1930s level, uh, when we first have a railway network in the UK. So it hasn't been improved that much. And we have the uh, world largest uh, uh, wastewater uh, treatment plant and a uh, world mail. And also we learn from us, from British Britain, about the roundabout system. We have the world largest roundabout in the world, <laughs> but it caused the, the worst congestions in China. Uh, I, I, I'm not mentioning the city there. And um, the reason that you can see that, we learned the infrastructure, not the mechanisms. So people don't really know or don't obey the, uh, the mechanism of the roundabout. You, you can't really have uh, five lines on the roundabout that will just uh, kill the mechanisms. Anyway, so that's the Chinese economic growth. But there's the resources behind the supporting the growth. 
And uh, the, so we trying to look at the emission, trying to do a te several tests. So the, uh, the emission growth in China over 1980s, 2002, so about 20 years time, the CO2 emission grows about tw uh, tw twice, it's a 200%. The orange line is the CO2 emissions growth for China over 20 years. And we decompose, so we separate this uh, CO2 emission growth by different uh, social economic factors. So I'm not uh, including populations, including economic structure change, etc. But there actually there are two major drivers here. The blue one is a per capita GDP growth, which is the consumption needs, the per capita consumption requirement. And the, uh, the, the red one is the technology gains. So basically, to control the CO2 emission growth, there's two major drivers. It become a risk between your demand and technology. So the government always think, okay, technology is so powerful, let's rely on technology. So we are trying to, over the last uh, next few slides, I'm gonna show you whether you know, there's a risk between GDP growth and technology, who is gonna win in the future is a very much uh, a policy uh, question. If the technology wins, we shouldn't worry about GDP growth. We shouldn't just let the technology do the work that most of us do, right? Uh, we just uh, uh, you know, rely on the technology, we always trust them. But whether they can win the game in the future. And soon later, in the next five years, and uh, we revisit the data and have some new data comes in. So we do this test again. Again, so uh, the CO2 intensity, which is technology, offsetting a lot of the CO2 emissions. But on the other hand, GDP growth, and uh, they are still uh, you know, racing uh, with each other. But there's another driver comes in, the production structure. Be the, during that uh, 2002, I'll give you some background there. Should, the, in 2002, China joined the WTO, the World Trade Organization. China start to become the world manufacturers in the world. So thanks to you to order so much, you know, uh, like uh, the benefits from the cheap products uh, from China, the Chinese economic structure has suddenly shift to a, a lot of cheap, but emission per, uh, intensive, emission intensive productions. So the economic structure changed and they actually join the game in terms of the, uh, the, uh, uh, the racing game to whether it's offsetting or it's increases CO2 emissions. And if you look at the, uh, you know, who is contributing this from a consumption perspective, over the last 27, 27 years, the capital investment, which is mostly construction sectors, ca capital investment you can see China building um, a high-speed rail, they are building airports, they are building uh, high, you know, uh, motorways, etc. So the uh, capital investment is the largest driver for Chinese emission growth. But uh, uh, in exports is playing an important role in driving Chinese emission growth. Chinese export basically you know, to the UK, to the, the US, etc. So the, our imports. And then we um, you see where the emission goes or the, where the exports goes. So we, we did uh, some of the work trying to uh, uh, aggregate the world uh, you know, all the countries into 10 regions, 10 world regions. But the first one we called East Asia, but mainly 95% is China here. So uh, uh, in one of the year, this is 2004, uh, Chinese embodied emission in exports. That means when you produce the export, the amount of the emissions you, you, you produce there, and actually we say it's embodied in this uh, trade products, it's 27% uh, of the total Chinese emissions. And uh, one third of that is, goes to uh, North America, US, Canada. Another one third is triggered by our consumption in Western European countries, the nine country, the traditional nine Western European countries. Another one fourth is triggered by Japan, Australia, and New Zealand. So the developed countries, or the OECD developed countries, 
is about take us about 60 or 70 percent of the embodied emission uh, in from China. So we are the con major contributors to 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 have Chinese embodied emissions. That's one year. This is the cumulative figure of from 19. Uh, 1990s to 2008. Um, it's about 18 years uh, accumulations. During the 18 years, this much of the emissions being accumulated and mainly triggered by us, Western European countries, uh, US and uh, Japan as well. So similar story. So as I said, the, uh, the, uh, the developed countries is the major contributors to the embodied emission in terms of growth as well to Chinese emissions. This, uh, I'm not going to scare you. You don't need to look at, understand these uh, figures. But I want you to pay attention to these red dots and these red dots, which on the left hand side is Chinese uh, embodied emission in the electronic sectors. The other one is the European electronic sectors. So the reason I'm uh, you know, popping this up is that you, I'll give you an example. There's um, uh, many of you who has, I've seen it, so several of you using iPhone, right? The, uh, the, the production uh, from Apple. So the iPhone 6, the production price for iPhone 6 is $178 US dollars. You possibly paid uh, 500 pounds to buy it, but uh, the production price, factory price was $178. And um, if you, you know, look at, if you ever pay attention, on the back of the, the case, they have a two lines. One is says, made in China. The, other, the second line said, De designed in, in California. So, uh, so that gives you the difference here. This is uh, made in China. This is uh, designed in California. Of course, this is a European uh, one. The, um, so $178 for iPhone, $4 made by Chinese firm, including all the labor costs, environment costs, the uh, resources, everything. And uh, $130, about $130 made by the California Apple company and, uh, and uh, Cooper basically. And, um, and the rest of them, basically $30, $40, is the international logistics. And uh, so that tells you even, so when we in China, they, they talk about not say made in China, but say create in China. And the create in China means, largely means moving to the upper uh, stream of the supply chain, or it means switch to a high value added uh, industries. So electronic production is classified as high, uh, highly value added sectors. However, the current status is still exists. Even the even in a high value added sectors, you have a lower part of producers and a high end of the producers there. So that's the difference. When we talk about a, a policy to, to encourage or to put uh, even subsidies to uh, to, to, to encourage the, uh, such transformations. And we, the, it's really is not move from one, uh, you know, one sector of the low end of the producer to another sector of the low end producer. You really need to shift up to the, uh, uh, to the supply chain, to the high, uh, the beginning of the side of the supply chain. So that's really is, is about. The, we say uh, CO2 emissions uh, exporting from China to the, uh, to, the Euro, uh, you know, to the UK, to Europe, or to, uh, to United States. But similarly, within China, it's still the same. So really, it's not the whole China producing for the world. Really, it's, this is the, the three provinces on the coast. They are the world manufacturers. So this, uh, uh, but they are not only uh, you know, withdraw the resource by them own, they are get support from the rest of China, from the West, uh, from North. So literally, um, the embodied emissions, or the emission goes like from uh, uh, economic lag behind regions 
to economic uh, uh, advanced regions. And uh, the, the pre-processed uh, products and uh, uh, resources goes to these three provinces. They further processing and make the products and go out to, the, uh, to, to us and to the United States as well. That's for, for CO2 emission. But when we talk about the local pollutions, air pollutions is the local pollutions, and it's, it's still the same, it's similar stories. Uh, you possibly heard there's occasionally have a news headlines showing a, a smog issue in Beijing, and then people run away, international firms run away because uh, they couldn't bear of the quality of the air. Partially because of industrialization process, but largely export, producing for export is actually making the con contribution for the air quality issue. So a similar story as I said, about one fourth contributed by the North American, another one fourth coming from the EU, EU 27 countries. Similar story as, as um, uh, air, uh, CO2 emissions. But uh, even local pollutants, they can create global impact. So one of the studies we published last year, basic is showing that this is China, this is how bad the Chinese air quality is. And, but small amounts of the air pollution, they can disperse, physically disperse across the Pacific to the west coast of the US. They could cause, in theory, could cause one smog day in Los Angeles because of the dispersion of the, the things, the, the air pollutants. So um, CO2 emissions, when we talk of CO2 emissions, people don't care so much because it's a global pollutant. It becomes global pollutants, it becomes everyone's pollution. Um, becomes everyone's pollution, becomes nobody's pollution, really. So, uh, but the air pollutant is different. They impact their health. And you, you breathe, the, uh, like say, a toxic air, and you get a consequence of your personal, physical, or mental health. And uh, even a little a significant amount or the majority of the amount of the pollutant stays in China, still a teeny tiny, a little bit cross over the sea, the ocean, and then reach you, whether you care about that. So even I'm saying that the pollution, the local pollutant would require the global effort to tackle it and then to, uh, to, to, to minimize it, basically. Remember the, um, the, the, the race, a game I talk about, the race between GDP growth or consumption and technology. So there's a, they are racing. Uh, who is gonna win in the future? So we did some interesting, uh, like say, in the academic we call scenario analysis, basically it's a game. So we say, let's tackle each of the, the sectors, each of the driver. So if every urban Chinese in the next uh, 20 years, they earn, averagely, they earn the same amount as what US people earn right now. And they have the same lifestyle as drive big cars, eat McDonald's three times a day, almost. <laughs> and um, and uh, I see, what's, what's the impact? So uh, what we call the westernizing lifestyle. So if we have a westernized uh, lifestyle and uh, Possibly people know this story, right? The super size me. And uh, some of the um, possibly uh, new uh, students wouldn't know. There's a, if I remember him, uh, it's Morgan Surplus, right? Yeah, he, uh, he did a test, see how, how the McDonald's could uh, destroy you. So he eats three months, three times McDonald's per day, and he gained uh, about 100 kilo, roughly, and uh, over three month period. And uh, he basically shows you how bad to the health of the, the, uh, the uh, McDonald's. Basically, McDonald's not only, uh, no McDonald's representative here, right? But anyway, so, uh, so the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the basically the burgers, the cheeseburgers, or the, uh, the beef burgers would, uh, would do something to your heart, to your brain, and also they have a huge impact on the environment both on the CO2 emissions and the water as well. 
So if we have a westernized lifestyles, every urban Chinese, there's a 1.3 billion Chinese there. Urban Chinese is half of them. If every urban Chinese has American lifestyles in the next 20 years, the Chinese CO2 emissions is gonna grow three times of the current right now. And uh, basically, we, Chinese emissions is currently is twice, almost twice of the size of the United States. It's the world largest right now. So if we grow another three times, so our effort to make climate change mitigation is just uh, become useless. Let's talk about adaptation, how we gonna fight or how we gonna adapt the climate extreme events, not saying to mitigate or to reduce uh, from them. But if we focus on the, um, the, uh, trans uh, the technology side, if we say we have best technologies, we have a CCS expert here, who is also the co-author for the paper, and uh, say it's, uh, the CCS basically represents as carbon capture and storage. What does that mean? So if you have a power plants and we have some clever technologies, we can capture so we can get this uh, carbon, uh, CO2 emissions from before you uh, emit from the chimney and liquidize it and then bury it under the ground. And uh, uh, you know, uh, David, uh, David Runner from Cambridge, they did uh, some of the surveys, uh, possibly maybe reach some of you saying that uh, whether you are interested to, to have a liquidized CO2 emissions in your back garden because we need to find a place to bury it. Because uh, it's and, uh, whether it's uh, below, you know, down below the sea or under your back garden. Uh, and uh, most, I remember the, the, the results is the oh, you know, majority of people would uh, say, um, uh, the CCS, the uh, carbon capture storage technology is very good, but not in my, in my back garden. <laughs> so, uh, Anyway, so even say we find a way to where we bury it, and uh, so we have the CCS technology, one of the best technology in the world to capture the CO2 emissions. This Chinese CO2 emissions is gonna still be same, similar to what we have right now. Although it's still, you know, slightly, uh, you know, much less than the reference or the business as a euro, but still similar as right now. That means we are still, China still not be able to commit any of the CO2 emission reduction in the near future. So, um, so let's see, uh, if China trying to reduce the CO2, uh, commit some uh, uh, you know, CO2 reduction commitment, uh, like the Kyoto Protocol said, the Chinese uh, energy will need to be about 60, uh, sorry, 40% powered by renewable energies. Renewable energy means, you know, water, uh, hydropower, solar, wind. The current renewable energy uh, proportions in China is about seven or eight percent, but that needs a significant increase to the forty percent. And uh, uh, financially and technology perspective is not not gonna uh, happen in the near future. The above is really about the whole China, but China is, uh, is a big country. It's a similar size, a little smaller than the, uh, the U, uh, EU27. But basically, there's a 30 provinces of that. It's a full of inequalities within China. Economically you know, speaking, the coastal, the east coastal regions, they are more advanced than the cities like Shanghai, Beijing, they are very much uh, modern, there has no difference. Actually, to, to my opinion, it's much m more than there than, uh, than New York or even, uh, even London. So basically, it's, uh, from infrastructure perspective, that's, uh, that's the case. From emission perspective, they are full of inequality as well. So the, um, the, the traditionally lag, uh, economically lag behind regions like Inter Mongolia and Ningxia, which is the, they are the highest so they, they have the, the most per capita CO2 emissions. Why? They are not to say they are very rich. Certain a, a few dots or few cities in there, they are quite rich, but the overall they are very, it's still very lag behind. The reason for such 
you know, high intensity because we discovered a good, co a good quality of coal in that area. So we just dig them out and burn it to generate electricity. And the electricity used that for aluminium processing, for example, which uh, require huge amounts of electricity and other type of processing. And those, um, those uh, materials will go to other part of China for consumption and, uh, or, or export. When we look at those uh, uh, emissions on the, within the regionals, there's always data issues. So, so I'm a, a more like a, from an an analyzed perspective, we need the data. And the quality of the data is, you know, is the, uh, the key for, uh, to produce good quality of research. So but when we put the, uh, the emissions uh, for the regional 30 provinces, we discovered this huge issue about the uh, data here. Um, there was a paper in two, uh, 2009, it's also uh, published by our colleague, uh, Corinne Laquerie in UEA, and really it's saying that um, there's a huge uncertainty about climate change in the world. But one of the things we can be pretty sure is about how much fuels we burn globally, because they are controllable, you know, you, you, you know it, you, know, how you, you make a record for that. So they give us some estimates saying that there's uncertainty range for global fossil fuel emissions is 5%, roughly 5%. But when we look at the Chinese data, we are a bit shocked. Actually, we compare the two official published data sets in China. One is nationally published, the other is provincial, uh, you know, uh, 30 provinces, at the province level, they published. The 30 provinces in China, when they aggregate together, when they add up together, they should be similar, same, or at least similar to the national one. But actually, there's a huge gap here. The gap here is 1.4 gigatons. You know, that possibly means nothing, but it's about 5% of global total. It's 20% difference between these two uh, within the nation. So that is very, very shocking, actually. When you have a 20% of uh, difference, you shouldn't call as a statistical error or like uncertainty. This is basically just an error. And uh, we trying to, because China is the largest emitter in the world, and uh, every, uh, all the climate policy, nationally and internationally, relying on you have a solid baseline. So when you say you, you reduce 5% or like say 10%, whatever percentage, you need to apply to a solid baseline. If you don't have, your, your number is of one board like that, whatever you talk about, you can make it up. So it's eventually it's gonna become a, a number crunching game if you don't have a solid baseline. Um, over the last few years, we published a paper very lately in August, uh, in Nature, received a huge amount of, uh, you know, this is just selective of the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the media interest, saying that Chinese emissions have been overestimated. So that is our conclusion for the paper. Basically, it's like, it's this one. So, um, collaborate with the Chinese colleagues and uh, benefiting from one of the large projects of, of theirs, uh, they actually surveyed uh, almost 6,000 different coal mines in China, just one by one, collect samples from them, and classify the coal into 700 different categories. So when we have uh, um, some of the uh, uh, you know, aged people, then you may burn the coal, you have some experience, you possibly think of there's uh, like a, not even sure you, you, you use a brown coal anyway, but anyway, there's possibly a, a few type of coals, but they classify them into seven different type of, 700 different type of coals. So then, uh, and then do these uh, tests. So basically we find this is the, uh, the right one. It's uh, our, based on this uh, in large survey the data, and this is the emissions we have. And actually they are 14% less than EDGAR database, 9% than the US database. Basically, these two databases 
are the kind of official database by using, uh, using by the United States, the IPCC, for example. Um, why this is lower? Because there's uh, poor regions in China. They burn poor, uh, low quality coal, as I said, brown coal. Brown coal means they're not even black color. So they are actually uh, half of them, they, they, they burn bow. But uh, they, they, uh, you know, half of them is just, uh, when you burn it, just become a dust, they go to the, the air. And uh, that's the one of the reason there's so bad air quality in China. So when they burn the low quality coals, there's not so much coal content there, not so much carbon content. It doesn't, doesn't get so much heat what you want. Therefore, you burn so much of that rather than the good quality coals. That's really, really the, the statistics coming from. But uh, this is actually, um, you know, draw our international attention. Uh, being saying has actually created some of the goods um, like a bargaining chips for for the China in the Paris because uh, they're saying that they're actually saying that uh, actually we eat we didn't emit that much we can actually emit a little bit more but it's not the case because we are have one uh, overall aim to reduce CO2 emission to limit the two degree C uh, target and the amount of we, we, we get, which uh, you know, is a little bit lower, has good benefits, but we, China is still the world largest sales emitter in the world. It's still about over 50% higher than the, the next one, the US, United States, the second largest emitter in the world. After we sort of uh, figured out the, uh, the, uh, the emissions, uh, then we, we come for the policies. We really see when China emissions can be peaked. So that's one of the big questions uh, the in Paris they are trying to ask. They are trying to ask you when, China, you know, when can you peak and how much you can peak. So we, we do some uh, policy surveys for them. So we project the, uh, the Chinese emissions, how they are going to go forward in the next 20 years. And this is what we got. So by business as euro, you need to emit so much, but with the, uh, the Chinese emission peak, you actually you need to reduce this much over the next 30 years. How you can reduce that? Um, there's a 50% by improving technology and changing the economic structure. Another 30% by using low carbon fuels. In Chinese, in China term, Natural gas is low carbon fuels, but here in the UK it's different. Uh, low carbon fuels and the renewable energies. But there's still there's about 20% left there. The 20%, you know, China creating a, a, another market, a carbon trading market. It's traded like a stock exchange, you just buy the carbon, well, in pr simple term. And uh, you buy the permits. Um, uh, in theory, and you 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 use the you, you use the permit to to construct the uh, the re renewables or carbon neutral products. So this is the the sort of the way we we can go forward. But it's still very challenging. It's not to say easy to do, but it's very challenging. China is it still is has been the world manufacturers over the last oh, about twenty years now, oh, fifteen years at least. Um, so when the Chinese economy goes up and people want to have a better environment a little bit and uh, the labor cost, as I said, you possibly heard the, the one of the, this, uh, the, uh, this, uh, the, the uh, breaking news in China is that China free, out, free the one child policy. Uh, so the reason for that is the population, they need more laborers, especially, especially the young laborers and the, they need another baby uh, booms, but it hasn't had to arrive. Anyway, so the, uh, giving the cheap products uh, produced by China is going to be less and less. So the world economists would uh, say, so where are we going to get the cheap products from? So they propose these things, what they call post-China 16s. So they are saying that there are not going to be one country produced for the world anymore. And it's going to be a, a, a bunch of countries produced for the world. 
So if that happens, this is going to be from environment perspective, it's going to be very bad. The reason for that is that China, right now in China, uh, there's about 20 years they learn how to produce for the world. There's a learning curve to achieve the efficiency you achieve right now. And uh, if you move all the industries to India and to Vietnam, to Mexico, uh, what else, there's uh, Estobia, etc. You know, people need time to gain the same efficiency. It may not take 15 or 20 years, but at least take 10 years or even more or even longer for, for the same efficiency level they do. But if you have, a, for example, if you move to India, you have the same or even, bad, even worse uh, energy structure. China burns 70, so 80% of uh, Ch uh, Chinese uh, energy was coal. Indian currently is 75%. But they're kicking off, kicking out, uh, kicking off the industrialization process. They're gonna use more coal. They're gonna be more, you know, coal dominating economy. So if the things move to India, then there will be another emission giant in in China, uh, in the world. So after, let's say, in Paris, we we say China is gonna peak. And uh, in the next 20 years, they're going to see another, say, Indian or Indonesia has become another emission giant. Really, it's not the point of the global environment change or global environment change mitigations. It's we should aim for the global, not for the one single countries. As uh, Kyoto Protocol, my personal opinion, one of the mistakes they, they uh, got is at that time, developed country was the major contributor to the to the world at that time in 1990s. Therefore, they kick, you know, they put them, their head down, say, you sign this, and you, you're gonna reduce your emissions. But a few years later, China become the world uh, emitters, the largest emitter. Now in Paris, take them another big effort to make uh, the, the them, uh, to make China to sign very, very likely, China is gonna sign something very firm to peak their emissions and uh, possibly in the next few years, you're gonna get India, Indonesia to peak. So there's endless, it's gonna be a cycle. So really, it's, a, it's, it's a find uh, one of the, the, um, the solution for that. What I said from, a, well, let's put it economic in here, um, can be summarized what I call the triangle trade, triangular trade. So really, it's what is the, international trade or the, the all the countries can be all the country in the world from the trade perspective can be classified in the three you know rows and we got consumers like in in US and us and uh, we got producer like China and also we got resource providers like Africa and the Latin American countries what's that flowing here it's environmental resources, emissions and environmental resources flowing between uh, the, uh, the, uh, the countries here. The producers is connecting the consumers and resource providers that, to do these things. If this, this, this is the, uh, the, uh, the triangular trade right now, but if uh, we are all familiar, maybe many of you are familiar with 400 years ago, we have this uh, slavery trade. Atlantic slavery trade, what they called, and at that time was uh, was Britain, uh, you know, uh, get the resources from uh, North, Amer North American countries, and then then uh, process them and then uh, shipped to the Africa, and uh, you know, like ram wines or the cotton products, etc exchange for slaves and slaves go back to North America to engage with uh, agriculture and uh, some preliminary processing products. This is what we call uh, uh, slavery, Atlantic slavery trade. And 400 years ago, at that time, what is flowing right now, uh, at that time was free labor. But if you think about right now, it's uh, labor, we don't need free labor anymore and it's a, almost a free resources. So the whole flowing patterns hasn't been changed. Only things change is a factor of production. So basically what's the, what's the most important for economic production? 
At that time, it was labor. And there's other, you know, right now, it's resources. If we use this uh, climate change as a, uh, you know, reflect to the slavery trade, it took the whole human race 200 years to get over this uh, slavery trade. And actually, but in the end, there was a very strong agreement and a very strong policy. Even the Britons sent the battleship uh, you know, in, the, in the seas and to, 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 to uh, minimize the, the, the trade and to, to, to get rid of it. Whether we have such a strong um, uh, you know, policy or at least a willingness in the world to have this. But on the other hand, some of the economists will say, okay, the slavery trade actually is not because of policy. It's, uh, there's a famous book called Capitalism of the Slavery Trade, basically saying that we had the industrialization. We, need, we don't need labor anymore. So let's do them a favor to really, uh, free them because we, have, we can see there's a machinery that's going to replace the labor uh, by then. But if you link it with the climate change, whether we do a favor for the, when we are going to do a favor for the CO2 emissions, Possibly when the wind powers and solar powers, when the electric, uh, when the technology become cheaper, then you you can you need to let's say that do them a favor. Let's sign a global agreement to do that. But is it too late? Uh, what's this? Uh, you know, what's the impl uh, implement You know, the implications for for this. Um, Okay, so last a few notes. Basically, I talked so much, everything else, but in, to summarize, there's regional corporations, both inter, within the country or across the countries, is, is a powerful force in the global economy, but not really in the climate change mitigation field. Consumption emission mitigation, potential distribution emission mitigation, uh, reduction responsibilities, but they don't is sufficient right now. There's no economic mechanisms to tackle the emission reduction. Such a uh, mechanism should be designed and should be care about what we call distributional effect, which really to care for the poor, care for the for the for the for the for the uh, the low income uh, populations. Whether peak emission peak in China is a good idea to me is not really. I think. From the global perspective, uh, we should, uh, you know, the efficiency on one hand, the producer should uh, increase the efficiency. On the other hand, as a consumer, we all are, as a global way, we should uh, lead a sort of more sustainable consumption ma manner to become a fashion because the 1.3 billion Chinese and the 1.2 billion Indians, they are trying to learn uh, our lifestyles. They see our lifestyle as a fashion or is the way forward. And uh, we need to change it. Not say UK reduce 80% of CO2 emission. It doesn't do any, it doesn't do much to the global climate change because just simply because we are too small. But if we lead a fashion or lead the fashion to a sustainable consumption that could do a, a lot more to a developing country populations where there is about about 40% of the global population there. I think I, I, I have my lecture here and uh, thank you very much. <laughs>